David and Goliath. The story of the little guy who, through some clever strategy, managed to take down the big guy. We've loved telling that story through the ages. And in business, we've been telling that story a lot lately. We've seen our industrial giants, some of our last generation tech firms, fall before startups and upstarts. In the cellular industry, which I study a lot, we've seen Motorola, Nokia, Rim Blackberry. They've all gone from completely dominant to bit player in a handful of years. It's pretty striking. So it's not surprising we're fascinated by the theory of disruptive innovation. It, it tries to tell us some of when and why these firms are vulnerable, these dominant players might be vulnerable. And in my own research on the wireless service industry, I've found some suggestive evidence of this power of startups, this effectiveness of startups. When we compare how firms entering the wireless service industry grow, when we compare startups to entrance established players coming in from outside, we see these startups grow faster, initially. But over time, their growth falls off. They enter as triumphant Davids in terms of growth, but little by little, they fall back until they're actually growing more slowly than these established players. And when major change comes to the industry, they fall even further behind. So these established players, they actually seem to have some adaptive advantages we might be interested in. And that's why I want to talk to you today about, about a piece of research that we think may shed some light on what sorts of advantages these established players have. The, to think about where those advantages come from, just think of these startups when they first come into cell the cellular industry. What advantages do they have that make them these fast growers? Well, they're starting from scratch. They can put the pieces of their business together so that the, the operations, the marketing, the pricing, all the elements of the business model really work together effectively. At this moment of entry, they're masters of strategic integration. But over time, changes happen in the industry. They require those parts to be put together in a new fashion. And it appears that the established players, the giant telcos, the cable television companies, they're actually noticing and reacting to these changes. They're managing to adapt. Now, this is mostly speculation, theoretical speculation, that, that we're trying to interpret what we find in the growth data here. Strategic, strategic integration is awfully difficult to see in practice, it's difficult to measure, and even if we think we've observed it somewhere, it is um, even harder to say with confidence that the performance of some firm is actually the result of this integration. Because these companies are run by smart people, they're doing the best they have with the elements of the company, and they're anticipating what might happen in this industry. So in terms of research, integration is a pretty tough nut to crack. Now, around the time that I was finishing this, uh, this study on the cellular industry, I was moving to Bocconi, joining the Department of Management and Technology, and Jan Voss walked into my office. Jan was a PhD student at Bocconi, well-trained in methods, interested in strategy and organization, and deeply passionate about cars and motorsports. Jan was, Jan is, a huge Formula One fan. He knows the sport inside and out. And Formula One is a fascinating sport. I'm not an expert, but I've learned something about it. The, uh, the cars are miracles of modern engineering. They, they do things that those of us in our everyday cars can't quite imagine, the kind of performance that teams eke out of them. And they do it with up to 10,000 precision parts carefully integrated. The teams are marvels of organization. They run huge budgets, they have as many as a thousand workers in their system, and they manage broad supply chains. As Adam Parr puts it, who was the former leader of Williams Racing, no relation, um, winning in Formula One 
requires mastery not just of multiple technical disciplines, but also the economics and the politics that are essential to the competitive position of each team. So, multi-dimensional sport, a lot going on, and a lot of these dimensions line up with what we know are very important in business. And Jan Voss is aware of where the official observers of this industry and the obsessive fans track every aspect of the sport. So we can see not just how the teams and their drivers are performing in races, but we can observe changes to the car, to different components of the system, and when they're reported to have problems, blowouts in engines, difficulties with aerodynamics, problems with, with brakes. So we want to use this to study if some of these teams are actually better at this strategic integration than others. Now we start by looking at changes to the car, the engineering of the car, and whether that results in better performance, fewer problems in the car, and, and faster racing. But at this broad level of the data, we actually don't find much in the way of stable patterns. Now, there's another aspect of the sport I need to tell you about, and that's the rules. The governing body of Formula One sets wide-ranging rules. They cover and restrict aspects of the car, the operations of the team. And from season to season, they frequently change these rules. They may change them to improve the parity between teams. They sometimes change them for the financial benefit of the sport, and sometimes for other reasons. But what we discovered is that sometimes these rule changes require a team to change the supplier for an individual component. And this looks like a classic integration challenge. These teams need to learn to work with a new part, build a new relationship with a supplier, all while designing and improving and racing their car. So we want to see, uh, we want to see what happens with this integration challenge. We choose a rule change from 2007. For the first time, the sport announces a single tire supplier for the entire sport. Before that, some teams had worked with Bridgestone, others with Michelin. As a researcher, this looks a lot like a naturally occurring experiment. We have a control group, teams that had worked with Bridgestone in the past, after the rule change, can continue to work with Bridgestone. We have a treatment, a set of teams who are subject to this new integration challenge. Those that have been working with Michelin, now they have to work with, with uh, Bridgestone. And we can compare the performance of these two different groups and see how they react with the system of the car and how that impacts their performance. So what do we see in the data? Well, not surprisingly, the teams that are forced to change supplier, they see their performance fall. And when we look more deeply at what we can observe in the car, they have more problems with their car. More problems with the tires, sure, but also with other components of the car. So this change in tire supplier is cascading through the system. It's creating changes and potential problems in other components. And not all teams are reacting to those problems the same. Now, we're strategy researchers. This is just what we're interested in. Are some teams actually better at adapting to this change than others? And we do find that there are some differences across the successful adapters and the others. They, they make more changes to the car, they have fewer problems, and they perform better in the races. But to understand what kind of changes are really making a difference, I need to tell you about one other concept from the study, and that is an engineering dependence matrix. It's a mouthful, but what it means, basically, is it's a map of how the different elements of a system relate to one another, which ones are tied more closely and which are more distant. <clears throat> Imagine that your car, the components of your car, are several islands, your engine, your chassis, the steering, and some of those islands are closer together and they have a bridge between them, whereas others are further apart and there's no bridge. The dependence matrix is basically a map of those bridges. So we take this to the data and uh, uh, start to build one for a Formula One car. 
Ron talks to and uh, surveys a number of retired Formula One engineers, some industry experts, and uh, and this is what this is an example of what we get back. Take just a simple component, the second column there. That's a spark plug. There's one connection from that to the rest of the car. It's linked to the engine. But a more typical component will be connected to several other systems in the car. And we find, when we bring this to the data, that not all changes are having the same effect. This matrix allows us to separate changes to systems that are very far, not closely connected to tires, from those that are much more closely linked. And what we find is it is only changes to tire-related components that are affecting the performance of the team, not changes to other systems, and it's not having the same effect in the treatment group. It's only these, these teams that were forced to do this change that are seeing a difference, and they are finding the more changes they make to other components connected to tires, the fewer problems they're having with their car, and the faster they are in races. So it really looks like when this tire change happens, some teams are perceiving how it flows through the system. They're noticing the potential problems that it introduces into the system, and they're reacting. They're solving those problems more quickly than their competitors can. So these are the strategic integrators of Formula One, and in terms of uh, race day performance, it's decisive. Now, We've looked at other aspects. In this, as part of the study, we looked at other aspects of integration and adaptation. We find, for instance, that this ability to integrate appears to end at the edge of the organization. When we look at changes by suppliers to components that suppliers change, uh, that suppliers control, it doesn't have the same effect on performance. And when we look for where this ability arises, it's not teams with more human capital. It's not teams where the leaders had more experience in the industry. It's the more mature teams, those who had worked together longer, who are figuring out this adaptation. But I don't have time to delve into those other, other results more, uh, more today. What I want to leave you with is just this notion of strategic integration. It really appears that some teams, some organizations, some companies, have a better idea of how the parts of their business go together, and when some change requires that they adapt that, they figure it out more quickly. Carrying this back to the cellular study I mentioned at the beginning, this looks like concrete evidence for what we thought we saw in that original study, that, some, that these established players are more able to understand how changes affect the system and take the system apart and put it back together to adapt and be more successful. Now, as far as Jan, he's graduated from the, the Bocconi PhD program with flying colors, excellent, and he's followed his heart right into our study. So he now is a manager in North America for Ferrari, one of the giants of, uh, of Formula One, and, uh, and a, uh, one of the subject teams in our study. Thank you.